Hi, I'm James, co-founder of Sugru. Has anybody here heard of Sugru? Lovely, you people. Uh, if you don't know what Sugru is, it's a brand new silicon technology that we invented. Um, feels, looks exactly like Play-Doh. Comes out of the pack, feels like Play-Doh. Uh, but people call it uh, Blu-Tac and steroids. It bonds to most materials, and overnight room temperature, it turns into a tough, durable silicon rubber. That's the sort of boring bit. Um, about three years ago, uh, we launched Sugru to the market. Uh, before that, we didn't almost didn't exist as a company, um, and we've been adopted by fixers, makers, DIYers, doers all over the world. Actually, in 120 countries around the world, and, and we have the extraordinary privilege of them emailing us what they use Sugru for. Uh, we get examples from fixing broken stuff. This is Ross in Florida. Hi Ross. He sent us a picture of his broken electronic toothbrush. The silicon rubber button on it broke and he used Sugru to rebuild it. And he sent that to us. So awesome. Thanks Ross. And then we have people who, who modify stuff a little bit. So this is Neil in the UK. His iron used to topple over all the time. And to solve that problem he gave it little penguin feet. And now it sits upright. Uh, and it's, it's amazing, really clever, simple solution. Uh, and this is something we're working on, where you can bond magnets to bike lights. You completely change the behavior of how you use something. So, you know, people all over the world are using Sugru to fix, modify, and, and transform stuff. Um, and when we invented this, I think we thought we were making it for, but for everybody in the world. Our, our mission is really to get the world fixing again. And we have this question of, is it possible for everybody, everybody in the world, to be hands-on problem solvers? And um, over the last few years, we've had, I think, I think we have you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands, in fact, of customers who we think might be the early adopters, the, the people who are natural fixers, makers, doers. And we have, we have this legal, this, this challenge, that we want to make everybody hands-on problem solvers. And I'm going to try and see how, through this conversation, just talk about how we think we might achieve that, or, or if it's possible, in fact. I'm going to start with Stefan. Stefan is in Germany. He's a dad, and his son, um, Linus, who was three at the time, was really into taking photographs. Stefan naturally wanted to support this, but was a bit nervous about giving Linus, a three-year-old, his digital camera. Um, so he did some research, he looked into kids' cameras, and discovered that uh, that they take really crappy photographs. And manufacturers, for some reason, think, think that kids won't notice this. Um, and they're also incredibly expensive. So he uh, didn't want to buy a crappy camera, so one Saturday morning, he sat down and he made this. Incredibly clever. With Sugru, he built little rubber walls around the lens and built interesting little shapes around the body of the camera so that Linus could hold it and grip it easily. And if he dropped it, and he dropped it, it would bounce. And so there's something remarkable about this. It looks cute, it seems kind of fun, but something really spectacular is happening here. And if we stop and think for a moment about how we normally behave with gadgets, with electronic products, I think we can see what's special here. So normally you buy a digital camera, it's uh, silver, shiny, metal, on the back it's got this big glass screen that we spend all our time trying not to scratch. And then we buy a case, and we put it in a case, and then we put it in a drawer and on the shelf and away from kids. Um, but in one Saturday morning, Stefan completely turned that in its head. On the Saturday morning, he, he reinvented the digital camera to do exactly what he wanted to do. He took control over the gadget. Um, and other interesting things, really exciting things, so for, for Linus, who's, who's three, he gave them the freedom to take photographs without the terror of upsetting his father, of, of getting into an argument with dad for breaking the lens on the digital camera. And another really exciting thing happened. He, he was able to, through doing this, through actually making this, teach Linus that if something doesn't work for you, you can change it, you can make it better, you can make it the way you want to. So, I'm, I'm incredibly excited about this project. We, we made a video about this, we posted online, well, obviously Stefan sent us images of this first. We posted online, and hundreds of thousands of people have watched it. 
and several people have made similar cameras for their kids. So they've learned through example to do something extraordinary like this. But then jumping back to my question, can anyone be a hands-on problem solver? This project, I have a little problem with it. And the problem is, in Stefan's day job, he's a product designer. So I think Stefan has been programmed to think like this, programmed to challenge things rather than just accept them as they are. And I'm still wondering, can anybody think like this? Can we all have that level of freedom and ability to adjust and change things to suit, suit our needs? Um, so I'm going to move on to something. This, this is something we've been working on with an amazing London uh, fencing manufacturer. They're based in Hendon, fifth generation fencing equipment manufacturer. And a few years ago, Alex there got in touch with us. He wanted to make customizable grips for his fencing customers. And so we set out on bringing all our user experience from working with super customers to a product design process. And, and we built this completely new handle design. And throughout the process, we thought we, thought we were making a handle that would allow fencers to create their own custom grips. And that was a pretty neat idea in and of itself. But when we put this in the hands of Olympic fencers, this is James Davis, Team GB. He fenced with our product this year. Woo! Go, James. Uh, when we put this in the hands of James Davis and Boss for Violin, two amazing Olympic athletes, something really spectacular happened. Um, rather than just making custom grips, they started to behave instinctively like brilliant product designers. Rather than just making custom grips, they started to interrogate the handle. They started building in features and details that were really specific to how they perform, how they fight. You know, adjusting the position of the thumb on the handle because of how he performs. Um, and I mean, this, this project is, for me, incredibly exciting. I could bang on about it for about a month, but I won't. Um, it, but, you know, some things in it that make that, that really excite me is the idea that consumers or users are actually much more intelligent than we give them credit for. Somehow, with this product, with, with customization built in, it generates a behavior that's, that's much, much greater than you might expect. And I'm wondering if that could be the future of product design, of giving more respect and space to consumers to create things for themselves. And of course, I'm going to jump back to the question, is, can anyone, can anyone be a hands-on problem solver? And in this instance, the, you know, it's a very specific product, it's a very specific use. I'm not so sure. I, I'm excited by the fact that people can respond in a hands-on problem solving way, but I don't know. I'm going to jump on to, to um, Joanne. Joanne's from Canada. She uh, is a canoeist, very fit, amazing woman. She emailed us a while ago with a story um, to say she wanted to uh, participate in a canoe marathon up the Yukon River. And it's only 715 kilometers long. Uh, but Joanne had a tiny, tiny problem. On her left hand, she has no fingers. If she was to compete in this race, uh, she would need to be able to paddle on both sides. So she would need to be able to use both hands. And Joanne wasn't able to solve this problem herself, but a friend of hers, um, and together with a friend of hers, they, they put a screw on her, on her canoe paddle and built up a shape with Sugru that would fit her hand, that would allow her to canoe. And she emailed us a few weeks ago to say that she had completed the marathon, uh, three days, three nights, uh, no sleep, 715 kilometers, uh, incredible. That's them celebrating. This is me celebrating. Uh, amazing story. And there's something, this, this, this story has two really interesting sides to it. One is, um, you know, back to the question of can anyone be a hands on problem solver? Uh, and one is that in this instance, Joanne had a really powerful motivation to change the paddle, to do something. Um, and I don't think we all have that level of motivation if a cable breaks at home or if the fridge door has a crack in it. We, we don't have that sort of urgency and need to change or fix something. 
But on the other side, since she's done this, you know, Joanne before this was not a what was not a DIY or a problem solver, but since she's done this, she's fixed loads more stuff. And what's really interesting there is when you fix something, uh, the world changes. The world literally changes around you. Once you fix one thing, you then have the ability to fix other things. You then you're, you're sort of trained to see problems and to think about solutions and to try it out and to find a way to solve it. And that's probably one of the really exciting things about this study here, or this, this example about, about Joanne. I'm going to draw a parallel between Joanne and her canoe race, that 715 kilometer mission that she set herself out to do, to this. And I say it's the same thing. Aaron and Galway repaying his laptop power supply is the same thing as Joanne changing her life and, and doing the 715 kilometer canoe run. It's the same as John in Connecticut repairing his kid's train set. It's the same thing as Jeffrey repairing the zip on his boots, on his motorcycle boots, or as Studio Banana Madrid repairing a broken mirror, or as Franklin in Germany uh, fixing the dishwasher rack, or Linda in London um, fixing a fridge drawer. The, the, um, yeah, and jumping back again to the question, can anyone be a hands-on problem solver? I think the answer is yes. At least I'd like to believe the answer is yes. And I think what's magical here, something happens with all of these people emailing us stuff. If you think about it, these are really mundane, everyday fixes. Yet everybody here took a photograph of those. Everybody here then uploaded that to their laptop, wrote an email to a company they don't know, to complete strangers, and saying, Fix my fridge, what do you think? This is amazing, I feel really good. And we post on our website. And the reason they do that is because, and I think it's really simple, fixing feels good. And if you fix one thing, I think you're on the way to becoming a hands-on problem solver. That's a short talk, thank you very much. Okay. Um, I might just start off with one. I'm Daniel Charney. Okay. Um, I'm now speaking on it. Speaker, much, much easier. Uh, I'm Daniel. I'm a, a curator and invited James to talk uh, today. And uh, together we are launching uh, Fixperts later on. Um, but um, when when you're talking about everyone, yes. Um, do you think that uh, people are inclined not to think about fixing more these days than they were in the past? Yeah. Yeah, I think... Yeah, absolutely. I think we, when, when things break, I think things are made to be replaced, almost. And if something breaks, immediately it's an opportunity to go shopping. Or it's immediately an opportunity to upgrade. And, it, and it's not so common for people to think, right, how do I fix that? So, so if... if you encourage people to fix things that were made in order to be chucked away. Is that not even just just a, a kind of reinforcing badly made things? Because <laughs> so there is uh, an argument here, and and I think we're right by the Great Recovery, which talks about the whole idea of circular economy and resources and influencing how things should be made, how how they should be designed, how they should be. Uh, taken apart, how, how these materials are. Now, if we are, in, if you are encouraging fixing badly made things, is there a contradiction there? Uh, no. no, I think if you fix stuff, um, irrespective of how well or badly they're made, you prolong your relationship with the thing. I think you, ch you start to change your relationship with stuff. Uh, and if you do end up buying something, you, you might buy differently. Um, I, th I think the fundamental thing is to change your relationship with stuff and change the way you think about things. And the moment you start fixing, then, then I, yeah, I, I don't think it's a contradiction at all. Has anyone got any questions that you would like to ask James about Suguru, how it came about, or where it's going? Yep. Oh, me too. We'll come back. Material first, and then think of an application afterwards. Or did you think of the application and 
but investigate for a specific material. Sure. So Jane, my partner, invented two group, and and it, it all began with an inquiry. Uh, she's really passionate about things, and and the story, one of the stories, is when she was a kid, she used to go to her granny's house and be absolutely mesmerized by her granny's world. All these things that tell the history of, of her grandmother. Um, and, and she was always in, in love with stuff, not because it's shiny or clever, but because of the story associated with the thing. Um, so she studied fine art and then design products at the RCA where we met. Um, and her objective was not to design new things, but to explore things. Uh, and then she created a material, and it was, I think it was, you know, it, all, all her passions and, and ideas were, were working towards something that was going to happen somehow, ultimately. Uh, and she created a really dirty prototype of Subaru. Um, and it took her a year of thinking and exploring to realize that Subaru, like, she was making really crazy things. Like, one of the early things she made was she covered a bicycle, an entire bicycle with this. So she had a bouncy bicycle. And she was exploring applications for the material. And one day she repaired the kitchen sink, the plug in the kitchen sink, because it was always leaking water and slowly draining. And she put a small piece of super on that, and she modified her knife so it was more comfortable. And I was with her one evening, and I said, wait a minute. I think you don't have to try and find the ultimate use for this material. What if the things you're doing now, what if everybody could do this? And that was the beginning. The beginning. It took a year of thinking and, and exploring to work out Subaru could be a material for everybody to use. Uh, thread for repairing clothes. Sorry? Like, like um, a lot of households have an Elan thread for repairing clothes, so you have like, other tools in the house. Yes, it's a material resource among duct tape and super glue and all these amazing things. Yes, absolutely. I mean, if I can pick up on that. Yeah. Um, uh, when you, I, I know that the company went through different stages, and initially you didn't go for this direction that everyone would use it. Yeah. You were looking at a very industrial application. Can you talk about how that, why you chose that, and why you changed? Yes. Okay. Um, thanks, Daniel. Nice support and question. Um, at the beginning, so the original idea was for everybody to be able to use this as a raw material, as to fix and modify stuff. When we were developing it as a business, we thought that the best way to market was to create a B2B product, a product that companies could sell, uh, build, mold onto uh, products to make customized grips. Uh, and we spent about three years all the time developing the technology, but we spent about three years working with other companies to launch products as a B2B. We thought it was the quickest way to market, um, and, and it's not. <laughs> It's a really slow process. And all the time, though, we were having conversations with new companies like uh, Bostic, 3M, and all the giants. Um, and we were hoping that we actually, at one point, we thought we would license Subaru to third parties like that, and they would do all the work of, of, of you know, putting Subaru into their infrastructure and reaching mass audience. Uh, but they were very nervous. They, big companies like proven ideas. They like to invest in things that work and have a massive audience. And, and after three years of conversation with companies like that, we realized, well, we need to do this ourselves. The only way to get this out there is to bite the bullet, build a brand, build communication that can capture people's imaginations and, and, and put it into the world. And, and that happened just three years ago. It, it, we took an awful lot of work to build one, the first 1,000 packs, six weeks of hand labor, making and packing and filling Subaru to make 1,000 packs. And uh, when we launched online, uh, Harry Wallop of the Daily Telegraph did a video blog talking about Subaru, and it went viral on the internet, and we sold out 1,000 packs in six hours. And that was the message to us that the world cares about this, that actually I think we made the right decision. How many do you produce today and how many people in the company? Okay, today we are, I think, 25 people. Oh yeah, we manufacture in London. We're incredibly proud. We have our own factory. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to clap that. <laughs> uh, we have our own factory. We have a team of 25 people. It's really... I mean, it fills me with joy literally every day. Um, and I don't know how many packs we sell. Uh, but how many countries, or just oh, the scale, the scale of so operation? So we sell into 120 countries from Subaru.com, and we sell thousands of 
ice. But I never look at those figures. Well, you are the chief. What's your title? I'm the chief Subaru guru. Which means? You can hit me with anything. <laughs> <laughs> Challenge me. <laughs> Anybody got anything broken? <laughs>